continuing our study in the book of Philippians. And so today, I want to talk to you about the idea of a formula. And just to describe a formula, if I was to go to Webster's and, and look up the, uh, the word formula, it would describe it this way. It's a method of doing or treating something that relies on an established and uncontroversial model or an approach. Another way to describe uh, formulas is pr a prescription or, uh, of ingredients in a fixed proportion or, or a recipe. That's a formula. Many of us who've uh, nursed children know that uh, another description of formula is uh, that mixture that you would mix up to, uh, to feed an infant child before they get on the solid food. Or it's an established form of words or symbols for use in a ceremony or a procedure formula. We need to understand that we can be at peace amidst life's crisis. We can be at peace no matter, regardless of the circumstances of our life. And so our goal today is to understand the formula for peace in our lives. To better understand what I'm talking about, if you'll turn with me to the book of Philippians. We're in chapter 4. And I'll read beginning in verse 4 of chapter 4 in the book of Philippians. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. May God add His blessing to the reading of His Word. Just to set the context for what we've been studying in the book of Philippians, which is critical that we set the context, particularly for the text today, because it's often misunderstood as some sort of a global statement. And so... The Apostle Paul begins the book of Philippians and he's talking to the church at Philippi and telling them that his earnest desire, his, his prayer is that they would experience spiritual growth, spiritual development. And in order for them to do this, he, he lays out the charge for unification to be in play and to be a, a, a big part of what happens in the church of Philippi, that there would be a unified body with one heart and one mind set on one purpose, and that is furthering the kingdom of God. And he goes on to talk about the importance of the, the individual, the Christian, the believer's involvement in this spiritual growth, as he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, knowing that it's God who works in you both willing to work for his good pleasure. In other words, we have an accountability, a responsibility to put forth effort for spiritual growth and to practice the spiritual disciplines, but we need to remember that we rely on God for the results and our spiritual growth, the results of those belong to God. And so next, the Apostle Paul says he's sending Timothy and he actually has sent Epaphroditus with this letter. And these two are his mentees. He is mentoring them, helping them to grow into being spiritual leaders in the church. And so he talks about this idea of guidance and that more mature believers would come alongside of less mature believers and to help, to help them grow. And he's sending people to do this in Epaphroditus and Timothy. Next, Paul compares the worthlessness of obeying the law in order to please God versus the idea of grace, unmerited favor. We're saved by grace. It's unmerited favor. It's not earned. It's a gift from God, not by works, so that no one should boast. And, he's, and he reminds the Philippians that it is worthless to just try to obey the law in order to earn God's favor. We've already ha we already have His favor. We, we don't need to work to earn it. It is already ours because we are His. Amen? And so he continues, and through his own example, the Apostle Paul gives an example of himself, and he, and he spells out his story, and he further explains the believer's responsibility to put forth the effort in the pursuit of spiritual growth, and he says, pressing on toward the goal, the upward call of God, is what he describes. Two weeks ago, 
Paul reminded us that there are these false sources of authority who will try to speak into our lives and that we have to be careful as to who we look to as leaders in, in spiritual leaders and so forth, which is uh, a concern that Paul had with, with what's going on and that there's specific mentorship that's involved, but we have to have our ears on. We have to understand truth. In order to do that, we need to study the Word of God. And then last week, we, we looked at some very short period of verses here that talked about conflict resolution and the importance of not having conflict in the church that goes on and on and on. And if people are at odds, that they need to work things out very quickly. And so that brings us to our text today. And Paul transitions into a completely different point here. But we needed to look at the context here to see what the Apostle Paul is talking about when he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And that's a literary device, by the way. Uh, we would call it the laws of emphasis if we were Bible scene investigators like our Tuesday night folks. And one of the laws of emphasis is repetition. If you see something repeated in the text, you know that there's emphasis being placed on it. What is rejoice? Well, friends, rejoice is a celebration. We would celebrate with a high school graduation or with a college graduate. There would be a celebration. You know, you have a big party and people give gifts and so forth. You celebrate birthdays. You celebrate weddings. You celebrate anniversaries. All kinds of things that you would celebrate because they're important things. And so he's saying celebrate or rejoice in the Lord. And he emphasizes Always Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Well, wait a minute. Always? I mean, in, in everything, even, even when the, the, the circumstances of life press down us so hard, we feel like we're going to be crushed. Yes. Rejoice in the Lord. Always. Again, he says, I say rejoice. So look at our text. Look at uh, the next verse there. He says, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. He goes on to say, the Lord is at hand. And that bodes to the statement that he just made. And the best way that I can describe this, this Greek word reasonableness in the context of what is being used is the opposite of the word is retaliation. In other words, don't be retaliatory against other people. Let your reasonableness be known, is what he's saying. And he goes on to say, the Lord is at hand. What does he mean the Lord is at hand? Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. In other words, don't retaliate against people who are persecuting you. The context of this, these verses today, friends, is persecution. These Christians are being persecuted by these folks that are trying to control them. They're trying to tell them what to do. They're trying to straighten them out. We, we read earlier about Judaizers that were doing a very similar thing over there. And so what's going on is these folks are persecuting these, these Christians here. And so he says, let your reasonableness be, no, be known. And then he goes on to say, the Lord is at hand. And it's a reminder, friends, that the Lord God is in our very midst. He is omnipresent. He's everywhere present and he transcends time and space. And so the Apostle Paul is reminding these folks, hey, God is watching. Let your reasonableness be known. Don't be retaliatory. Yes, these people are attacking you. And our tendency, friends, is when people are being kind to us, we're kind back. When people are being unkind to us, we have a tendency to want to be unkind back. If someone's attacking us, we're going to want to attack back. But the Apostle Paul is saying here, don't retaliate. Don't go back after these folks. Let your reasonableness be known. The Lord is at hand. You're a Christian. And he goes on to say, in an often misunderstood text, he says, do not be anxious about anything. And here's our formula. Here's the formula. But in everything, by prayer and supplication and with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and then all your troubles will go away. Oh, wait, it doesn't say that, does it? It doesn't say pray and then God will do exactly what you've asked Him to do, right? 
God is not a genie in a bottle. We don't rub the lamp and get our three wishes. But Lord, I'm at church every Sunday. I pray every morning. I don't sin as much as I used to. So you should be kind of doing what I want. I mean, he's not a vending machine, is he? We put our 75 cents in. We punch D4. Where are my Cheetos, Lord? Well, that's not what the text says, is it? The text says, be anxious for nothing. In other words, no matter how bad things are, don't be anxious. What's anxiety? It's worry. He says, don't worry about anything. And again, the context here is persecution. But friends, persecution, we do not wrestle with flesh and blood, but we wrestle with the principalities of the dark. And so persecution comes in all sorts of ways. Friends, persecution comes at us from all angles, in all circumstances, by the hand of the enemy. And he will do whatever he must and whatever he can do to trip you and I up and to keep us off task and to keep us off mission. One of the ways he does that is to create the circumstances of life that will cause us to be concerned and worried and distracted. So we're turning our arrows in, our focus inward, instead of where it should be, outward. But the text says, don't be anxious about anything, but by prayer and supplication and with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And listen, here's the promise. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Friends, the formula is this. If you have anxiety, if you're worried about something, if you have a concern, if there's something that's going on in your life that is keeping you off mission, pray to the Lord. Lord, these circumstances are keeping me off mission. And he says, with prayer and with supplication, you're making your request known. And with thanksgiving, in other words, you're thankful just because you're in the presence and have an audience of the Lord. Did you know that you have audience with the Lord God at any moment? 24-7, 365. You think you can get audience with the governor? You think you can get audience with the mayor? Like that? How about with the President of the United States? Well, the Lord God trumps all of those a billion times over, friends, and you have audience with Him 24-7, 365. What a blessing. What a comfort that is. That any time you want to enter into the presence of the Lord and speak with Him and have a conversation with Him, He's there. He's listening. He is everywhere present. Make your request known before the Lord, and the promise is that you will have peace. Does the promise say that circumstances will be taken away? No. Isn't is what you desire? Peace. So the promise is peace. But what is anxiety and what causes it? We need to understand the root cause of it. And I have a handout here. And if I could get some help here with, a, with the handout. If somebody could get these in the hands of everyone, this will help. We haven't looked at the framework in a while. And so... I'd like us to take a look at the framework. And while we're passing that out, I'll kind of set the stage for the biblical framework that we're going to look at here. That involves our understanding of anxiety. Or what I would term biblical worry. Many of you have seen this before, and I would certainly encourage every one of us to be very familiar with the biblical framework. If you notice up in the top left-hand corner, there is Mark chapter 12, verses 30 and 31, in which an individual came to Jesus and asked him, Hey, Master, what is, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus, without hesitation, answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor 
as yourself. This is the great commandment. The great commandment is to love. And we know, many of us uh, that, that have been in, in church for a time know, that the kind of love the, uh, that, we're being, that we're speaking about is agape love, or God, godly love. It's selfless love. And so the command, and is written in the imperative, it's a command. The command is for us to love God and love people perfectly. And when we do this, we're being obedient and we will not sin. The root of all sin is a lack of love for God and a lack of love for man. So that's in the top left-hand corner. And you'll notice here, all the way to the left, there's a word in red under that number two, over the number two, that says experience. And I've referenced Genesis chapter two as our, as our example of our experience. And if we remember in Genesis chapter 2, we've got Adam and we've got Eve and they've been placed in the garden and they walk with God in the garden. And they have this charge to, to care for the garden. And they're walking around caring for the garden and they have one command. What's the command? The command is not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They do whatever they want. They're supposed to care for the garden. Just don't eat from the tree. One, one simple command. And the text says they were naked and not ashamed. And I believe that's literal. I believe they, they did not have any clothes on. But the, the, the symbolism here is that they had no knowledge of good and evil. And they were innocent. They were innocent. And you'll notice there that next to that experience, I've got an arrow going up and an arrow going down. Adam and Eve had a choice. Their choice was... I could choose not to eat from the tree and be obedient to God, expressing love to God. How? By being obedient. Or I could choose to do what I want to do and be disobedient to God. Up top there, if we were to choose to love God, Adam and Eve, as long as they continue to obey God, they would, they would feel this this. Down bottom, the sense of love, the sense of approval, the sense of confidence, and a sense of drawing near. However, in Genesis chapter 3, we notice that they did what? Well, they decided, uh, uh, by some encouragement uh, from, from the serpent, to eat from the, the fruit of the tree. And afterwards, they hear the sound of God walking in the garden... In the cool of the day. And so what do they do? They hide. And so God walks in the garden and He's saying, where are you? Does God know where they are? Of course He does. He's, he's all knowing. He's all powerful. He's everywhere present. And this is a, this is, this, this is a, a, a theophany. He's, he's appearing this way so that they can see Him, of course. But he's, He goes to the man and He says, what's going on? And what does Adam say? He said, I realized I was naked, and so I was afraid, and so I hid myself. I realized I was naked, I'm guilty. I was afraid, I had anxiety, and so I hid myself. I fled. If you look across the top of the framework here, if, if we express a lack of love towards God, we're going to feel guilty. Now, over in Romans chapter 2, in verses 14 and 15, I'll read that to you. It says, For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do what the law requires, they are a law to themselves, even though they do not have the law. They show that the work of the law is written on their hearts while their conscience also bears witness and their conflicting thoughts accuse or even excuse them. Friends, the moment that Adam and Eve disobeyed God, they had the ability to discern the difference between right and wrong. And that is now written on your and my DNA per Romans chapter 2, verses 14 and 15. Whether it's, it says, and the Gentiles, that, that's, that's a, the biblical word there is, is for the unsaved. Even, even the unbeliever knows the difference between right and wrong. It's been written into our DNA. Thank you, Adam and Eve. And so, should we choose to disobey God, we will feel guilty. There's no such thing as false guilt. 
If you feel guilty, then you are guilty. So if we feel guilty, there, are, there, are, there may be displaced guilt. Perhaps we, we feel guilty and it's displaced in, in some way, but the guilt is this. It's our reaction, our response to our circumstances. And if we don't do anything about that, then we're going to drift over into the next one. Across the top of the framework there, that big A and U next to fear is apparently uncaused fear. That's biblical worry. Biblical worry, friends, is driven by guilt. Biblical worry is not driven by our circumstances. It is driven by our reaction to our circumstances. It is driven by our response to our circumstances. So in other words, if we have a set of circumstances in our life and our reaction, our response to that is, I don't like this. Well, it's written on our hearts. We know that God is sovereign. We know He's in charge. We know He's in control. God has dealt these circumstances into our life. And so we think that we're feeling anxiety because of the circumstances when in actuality we're feeling the anxiety because of our response to those circumstances. And that, my friends, when, when the Word of God says, make your request known before God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus, what you have done is you have placed the circumstances in the Lord's hands and said, you know best, whatever what, the outcome belongs to you and whatever happens, I trust you, you will be at peace. You have placed those in, in the Lord's hands. Now, if we continue to boil in anxiety and worry and frustration, what's going to happen is we're going to drift over into the last one here. Apparently uncaused fleeing. Before we do that, that first John 4, 17 and 18 says there's no fear in love. Because perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves punishment. And the one who fears is not perfected in love. And so if we're perfected in love, we're going to be down along the bottom of the framework here. Being obedient to God. Being in harmony with God. Being in fellowship with God. And we will feel peace. If we don't deal with this apparently uncaused fear, this biblical worry, we will begin to flee. Proverbs 28.1 says, The wicked flee when no one's pursuing, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. And so if we feel a need to get away from the circumstances, and there are all kinds of ways to flee, and some of them are sinful. Some people flee to alcoholism or drug abuse. Some people flee from their circumstances. Some people leave their spouse. Some people leave their job. They quit their job they, or, or, or whatever. Or it may be as innocent as just pouring yourself into reading books just to get away or, to, or perpetually watching TV shows or, or surfing the internet or, or what have you just to get away from the thoughts, the worry, see? So we want to we get to, to the peace, right? How do we get to the peace? Well, the, the, the simple solution is to love God and love, love man perfectly. But, you know, we all know that we fall, we fail, we trip. How do, you, how do you get from the top of the framework to the bottom? Well, there you have it, 9, 10, 11, and 12. First things first, you've got to be a Christian. You've got to be a regenerated being. Otherwise, there, there's no hope. The second one is that we're going to confess. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, He's faithful and righteous and forgives our sins and cleanses from all unrighteousness. We have to say with God, confess me to say with, we need to agree with God that we messed up. As believers, we know we're already forgiven. And so the next one there is the count on the forgiveness that's already ours. Psalm 103, 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far as He forgiven your sin from you. And you say, what? What about that one? You mean really even that one? Yes. Even that one. Next one is that we want to be controlled by the Spirit. Ephesians 5.18 it says, And be not drunk with wine, which leads to dissipation. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And so, if you it's written in the imperative mood. It's written in present and perfect tense. For you English majors, that means be being filled with the Spirit all the time. And if you're commanded to do that in the Bible, got to believe it's doable. So that means to be controlled by the Spirit all the time. We have to count on the forgiveness and to count on the control of the Spirit. In 1 John 5.14 says that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if He hears the request that we have made to Him, then we can count on the fact that He will answer that and honor it. 
And so if you pray to be filled with the Spirit, you pray to be controlled with the Spirit, that is in accordance with His will, and He will do it. You need to count on the control of the Spirit. And that gets us from the top of the framework to the bottom of the framework. So when you say, How, what's, what's the formula? What's the cure for anxiety? Well, it's to love God perfectly. It's to trust that the circumstances of life, to trust that everything that God has placed in our path is for a reason. And you say, well, I, I, I don't like that. <laughs> well, yes, there are a lot of circumstances in our life that are outside of our control. We, we, and, and there's nothing that you can do about it. You say you've got sphere of influence and you've got sphere of concern. Things out in the sphere of concern that are outside your influence, nothing you can do about it. Well, what do you do about that, Pastor Doug? I'm glad you asked. You can't control what other people say. You can't control what they do. You can't control what they think. And you can't control a lot of the circumstances in your life. But you can control what you say, what you do, and what you think, and how you respond to the circumstances. And so the formula back to our text today is make your request known before God and the promise is the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Peace is yours. And that's the goal, right? When we have the quest for more, we have the quest for, you know, for happiness and so forth. What are we searching for? We're searching for that feeling of peace. And it's already ours. It already belongs to us. As a child of God, you can be at peace. What's the fruit of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace. Patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. It is yours, friends. It is yours. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time together. All your many blessings. We rejoice in the Lord always. And the peace of God is ours. We praise you for that, Father. Thank you for that. Glorify your name in all of the earth, Lord. As we go now to this time of celebration, Lord, help us to turn our hearts and minds towards you in a way we never have before. Praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. We come now to a time of...